So I have this dream, and it's a beautiful summer afternoon. The sun is shining, and I am in my Italian convertible sports car. And I am racing down the California coastal highway, my hair streaming in the wind. And, and, and I glance over into the rearview mirror, and, and I notice how fantastic my Maui Jim sunglasses look against my spray tan. <laughs> when all of a sudden, there's this rumbling sound, and this massive earthquake suddenly hits the coast of California, and with a loud boom, shock, this huge hole opens up in the pavement right in front of my car, and, and I hit the brakes as I'm screeching towards this abyss in the middle of the road. And it's an awful moment, except for the fact I have spent thousands of dollars on personal trainers and cool sculpting sessions and I am toned and ready for exactly this kind of thing. And so with my ab muscles crunching and my reflexes firing, I leap up out of my sports car and land perfectly balanced on the pavement just as my car plunges down into the hole. And the last thing I see is the silver I went to Yale license plate cover, glinting in the sun, and then it becomes a total nightmare. Because as the car plunges into the darkness, it hits something and violently overturns, spewing oil all over my Armani sweatsuit and slicing off my arm. And I go into shock. And just then a motorist arrives and stops his car and sees me and I'm standing at the edge of the hole saying, my car, oh my gosh, my car. And he says, your car? You shouldn't be worrying about your car. You just lost your arm, man. And I turn and I look and I realize he's right. I've lost my arm. And I suddenly realize the seriousness of this situation. And I look back down and I say, my Rolex! My Rolex! <laughs> okay, I made it all up. But I made it up for a point. Because in more ways than it's really comfortable to admit, there is something of me in that story. Something of the attitudes and the aspirations <laughs> of me in that particular story. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I have been for many years now trying to live into the principles and the practices and the uh, priorities, I guess you'd call them, of what Jesus calls the kingdom of God. I want my life to be uh, about the things that God cares about most deeply. But I am still distracted from that mission at times by what I would simply call the shiny objects. Uh, all across American life today, there is this glittering distraction. There is this constant call to root my identity, my security, my significance in all of these things, all of this stuff. And as much as I try to keep focused on the things of God, I want to be devoted to him alone, I find myself called over and pulled over to all of these other uh, objects of desire. And I don't know whether I'm the only one who has this particular issue, but because I suspect I am not, I wanted to engage us in some meaningful conversation today and in the weeks to come about this particular theme. When I read the Bible, or perhaps you do as well, you just discover that uh, this is not a particularly new kind of phenomenon. Uh, we know that long ago, the children of Israel uh, were traveling through the wilderness. Uh, they were on their way to the promised land, to the fulfillment of their dreams and hopes, when God, in effect, sends them an earthquake. He stops them dead in the road, and, and he, he challenges them to think carefully about the course of their life. 
and about how they plan to go forward in that life. And, and he does this by giving a set of instructions to his people through the prophet Moses. And the set of instructions become famously known as the Ten Commandments. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of the Ten Commandments. Good. Okay. We're, we're on the same page. Here's how they begin. And God spoke these words. I am the Lord your God. I am the one who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now, I need to stop right there for just a moment because this is a very, very important message because it's the thing, the lens that you'll use to interpret everything else that is then subsequently said. Here's the text or the Twitter version of what God is saying here. He's saying, I don't want you to be slaves. I hate it when you're slaves. I hate it when you are in bondage, when you're burdened, when you're crushed, when you're oppressed by uh, by people and by things that don't care about you, that don't care for your true welfare. That is why I got you out of Egypt. That is why I have you on this road towards the land of milk and honey. It's because I want the very best for you and I hate it when you're enslaved. And then God goes on to give the Israelites these 10 instructions about how to enter into the promised land. And I want you to think about this for a second because that idea of the promised land is not just a geographic, geophysical place, it's a condition of life. God wants to take all of us to the promised land. He wants all of us to know a condition of life that is, in a sense, flowing with milk and honey, that's full of of potential and goodness and, and the healthiest possible stuff. That's his desire for us. He loves us like our mom loves us and more. That's the big idea there. And so God gives these instructions to Israel and by extension to all of us that would follow the people of Israel. And he gives them clues on, first of all, how to avoid giving their life away to dead things. You can go back and read this for yourself. How to give, avoid giving life to dead things. Secondly, how to reverence the source of life. How to live in a sense of wonder and and awe before the one who is the source of our life. He he says in in uh, another one of the commandments, how to avoid burning ourselves out. And how, frankly, to avoid burning out the people in our lives that are trying to keep up with us. And and the people in our workplace and family who are are wearing out sometimes trying to keep up with us. Uh, God gives them instructions on how to do right by their elders. Uh, I think actually you could make the case that Mother's Day and Father's Day are actually holy days. God says, honor your mother and father. He's that clear about it. Make sure you honor those elders in your life. And he talks about, in another commandment, about the the commandment to preserve life, to care for life and protect life. And, And he gives another instruction about how not to mess up your marriage Um, along the way, and in the remaining commandments, he goes on to advise us on how to be respectful, truthful, contented people. Now, I would make the case that the Ten Commandments are so incredibly practical, so relevant to everything that challenges us and beckons us in our day, that maybe we should put these things up on the wall. Has anybody ever thought of that, putting Ten Commandments up on walls? I I wonder whether we should do that because it is just, this is such important, important stuff. In fact, I did put it up on the wall. It hung all the years my kids were growing up. It hung in their bathroom. I hope they read it every now and then. You know, I hope they read it. Um, The very first of the commandments is, in fact, the most important one. It is the key to fulfilling all of the other ones. And if one gets the first one wrong, you can't get the other ones right. God's first instruction is this. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. Be devoted to me first is what he's saying. Please be devoted to me first because it's going to be your relationship with me that I will use to fill you up with the power and the perspective and and the grace that you need to live into your fullest potential. That's what I want for you. And so stay connected to me, be engrafted into me like the branches engrafted into the vine and other things good will flow from that. And whatever you do, 
do not make for yourselves gods of silver or, or gods of gold. Whatever you do, and it's like he's saying, this is going to be a huge risk for you. It's going to be a really big challenge for you, so I'm just going to lay it out here. Whatever you do, do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gods of gold. Don't get distracted from me and the life that I'm trying to give you by getting obsessed with all these shiny objects. That's really a, a fair translation, I think, here. Now, in biblical times, there was a, a different word for, the, for this shiny object idea, and the different word was the word idol, I-D-O-L. Author Michael Slaughter says that an, an idol is anything that receives the primary focus of my energy and my resources that ought to go to God. Anything in my life that has that, that, uh, that place. Idols, he goes on to underline, are actually good gifts of God which just get assigned a wrong priority. They begin to occupy a place in our life that's just too big. It, it's, it's too influential uh, and and. They go from being things which help us towards God to being things that stand between us and God and the other relationships of our life. So I want to ask you this question just as a benchmark at this moment. Is there anything in your life right now or in my life right now that could be called an idol? Nah. (laughs) Idols are for all of those primitive pagan people. We, in our time would never give in to idolatry like this. I was watching TV the other day, and this show comes on with these religious fanatics. They were crazy. Well, you would think they were crazy if you didn't understand their culture and their religion. See, that's just the thing. They were worshipers of idols, and they took things to extremes. They painted their bodies. They wore these ridiculous costumes. They chanted, they danced, they they made sacrifices to their idols. They had built these enormous temples to worship their idols in. It seemed like their entire existence climaxed into this one scenario, this one over-the-top act of worship. You don't really relate, do you? Let's try it again. I was watching TV the other day, and this show comes on with these religious fanatics. They were crazy. See, that's just the thing. They were worshipers of idols, and they took things to extremes. They painted their bodies. They wore these ridiculous costumes. They chanted. They danced. They they made sacrifices to their idols. They had built these enormous temples to worship their idols in. It seemed like their entire existence climaxed into this one scenario, this one over-the-top act of worship. Idol worship. It's not just about golden calves anymore. Ouch. Yeah, sports can assume idolatrous proportions in our life these days. Um, We started our Saturday night service here at Christ Church just because we had to deal with it, that so many people were now elevating uh, youth sports and the golden glistening shimmer of the golf course and early Bears games higher than the priority of of worshiping God, of of gathering with his, his people. Uh, it, it was just such a powerful, is such a powerful force now in uh, American life. Uh, our political tribe can have that kind of huge influence in our lives that it just, it actually usurps the place of God and, and uh, the, the people of God in our life. Uh, our, I, our family comforts can play that kind of role uh, in our lives. We actually have television temples now to celebrities and uh, musical celebrities. Uh, we actually call it American Idol, right? It, we've acknowledged that reality. Uh, I personally am one of those guys that watches The Voice religiously, I confess to people. I love that show. I remember sometimes that there used to be a time when the term The Voice made you think of God and not Blake Shelton. And uh, it's just 
what it is. It's a powerful influence. How many of you might acknowledge that these, um, these little uh, devices that we carry around in our pockets uh, are the shiniest objects ever created? So much so that we spend a lot of our days glued to them. Even we go out to restaurants and we're hanging out with our loved ones and we're glued to what? We're just totally tuned in because they take us into worlds of other devotion and, 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 and interest and, and captivation. Uh, we have a, a culture that is constantly driving uh, the sex god towards us. Uh, the, the, that's always pushing us to, to think about more and more diverse kinds of erotic experiences. We have a, a culture that is with an entire cult of youth and a desperate effort to constantly get us worried about the fact that we're aging and we should be looking younger. Uh, it's an enormously a seductive thing. We have online shopping centers and physical shopping centers that just enwrapped us these days. And on one level, all of these things, from sex to sports to TV to all of it, is a good gift of God. It's just that it gets the wrong priority. It gets too much of the priority and the attention in our lives. They eat up these things, eat up time and energy we might have actually devoted to real relationships to, to knowing God more fully, to reading the Bible, to, to, to sharpening our minds, to building deeper relationships with the precious people around us, to even going out and savoring the incredible beauty and glory and goodness of this creation that God has made for us. Uh, even these idols, they, they, they eat us up so much, we stop even thinking much about, much less addressing the serving needs of so many people uh, within our reach. So, here, here's just one tough truth I'm just going to pass along because I, I guess I've seen this so often. Most of our kids aren't going to be D1 athletes. Some of them will. But most of them won't. And, and an even smaller percentage are going, are, are, are going to become um, professional athletes that take care of us in our old age. But, but in just the sports god area alone... We are, are so focused on this now as a culture that, that we are willing to, to, to bow down to this particular idol at the risk of our kids never experiencing, or at least in the consistent way they need to experience it, encounter with Jesus and with the people of God in a way that would give them a moral center and a worldview that would actually be profoundly more useful to them in every sphere of their life over the years to come than what they have experienced by the time they, they grow up. So I, I just think we got to think about this. Uh, we have got to think about this. I think most of us would be better off having deeper marriages and deeper friendships than being a little bit better at whatever the obsession is, a little bit more knowledgeable about whatever the obsession is in our life. You see, worship isn't a, a 75 minute once a week thing. Worship is the orientation of our life 24 seven. Uh, the word worship literally means, it's a contraction of two words, it means worth, T-H at the end, worth ship. Worship is whatever we give worth, consummate worth to uh, in our lives. That is what we actually worship. And that's why maybe the most important thing I could ask you today, I think the kindest thing I could ask you, and frankly the most controversial thing I could ask you is, what are your idols? What are yours? What is it that gets the worth truly in, in your life? What or who do you really put first? So, I told you that little story at the beginning, you know, the car going down to the hole at the beginning. Um, and I really meant it when I said, this is every bit as much a challenge for me as it is for anybody. Um, I want, in my clearest moments, to be devoted to God above all else. And, and there's a part of me that always sees myself as, first and foremost, devoted to God. 
And I bet if I interviewed you, you'd probably say that's true. I'm, yeah, I'm first and foremost devoted to God. But what I do, this is the game I play with myself, is I think to myself, I'm devoted to God, but I'm going to diversify a little bit. <laughs> you know, I'm going to have these other things that also bring me a sense of security and significance and identity. And I'm sure God won't mind. I'm just going to just so put my coins and my chips on a bunch of different things over time. The problem I find in my own life is that I give myself to these diverse distractions and they eventually become for me more like obsessions. They become dominating forces in my life. And I wonder if it's that way for others of us too. Not enough Christians today or churches are saying this. I'm just going to be really blunt about it. God doesn't suggest that we worship him first. He commands that. He, he, he commands that. He, he says, you got to do this. you got to put me first in your life. you got to make me the object of your devotion, your first love. Diversification and devotion are at opposite ends of a spectrum. Um, you can have interests, you can have, and we should. God has made a world of multiplicity. He could have made everything gray in one shape. He didn't. He chose to make things multicolored and interesting. And I, of course we're going to be interested in things. But we have to have a priority order. He wants us to put him first. And so God says, in very direct terms, do not forget the covenant I have made with you. This is what he said through the prophets to Israel. It applies to us. Don't forget the covenant I made with you and do not worship other gods. Rather, worship the Lord your God for it is he who will deliver you from the hands of all your enemies. Let me just translate that into common language. God is saying, I want you to make a covenant with me. Remember the covenant covenantal relationship that we have. It's an exclusive vow of loyalty that you're making to me and I'm making to you. I'm asking you to commit yourself to this relationship above all others. It's kind of like marriage. In fact, the marriage covenant, Jesus often says, is a symbol of or a a reflection of the larger covenant that God wants with his people. And, and if you think about it, that's a helpful way of looking at that because what's the word we use to describe when somebody who is ostensibly in a marriage covenant then chooses to get distracted or diversified in their love interests? What's the word we have for that? It begins with an A. Adultery. And it, it rhymes with expensive divorce. Okay. Yeah, so not a good thing. And in the Deuteronomy version of the first commandment, God says that he is jealous about this. Now, we hear the word jealous, we think, oh, insecure. God is insecure. No, God is not insecure. God's not going to be the big loser if we don't prioritize him, if we diversify and fall in love with everything else. He's not going to be the big loser in that. But the original Hebrew word for jealous more properly meant passionately invested. God is passionately invested in human beings. He's deeply interested in our well-being and in helping us to find this life of flourishing and thriving. And not just us, but the other people that he hopes that we will reach out to and help along the way. So the, the first problem with letting our devotion to God slide way down and be underneath, down the list from a lot of other things that we really care about, the first problem with that is it does affect him. Because he is so passionately interested and invested in us, it affects God when we do this. Um, It hurts God's heart like it would hurt your mom's heart to have you forget her. You know, does it touch us in any way? Is it helpful in any way to think about that? Does it sadden us to think we might actually be wounding and inflaming the heart of the very one who gave us everything, our life, and, and gave some of, uh, of that to us, obviously, through our moms? 
There's a second problem, too, when we get comfortable with idolatry. And I use that term, that term comfortable intentionally because, I'm just be honest, we're going we're gonna to be attracted to the idols sometimes, right? There's a lot of shiny stuff out there. There's going to be times when we just lose our focus on God. Squirrel, you know? I mean, it's, that's, that's us. That's what it means to be, to be a human being. The, the problem is when we get comfortable with that, when we get okay with that, when we, when we lose our self-correcting mechanism about that. And, and the children of Israel experienced that problem. They got comfortable with idolatry. They allowed all kinds of other influences in. It tainted their moral vision, their spiritual purity. It was a, a major problem in ancient Israel. And so in 2 Kings chapter 17, we hear God's uh, read on the impact of that kind of long-term comfortability with idolatry. And here's the quotation. They would not listen, however, but persisted in their former practices. Even while these people were worshiping the Lord, they were serving their idols. Even while they were going to church, they were into all the idols just the same. Does this sound familiar? Right? And here's the key part, that very next verse. To this day, their children and grandchildren continue to do as their ancestors did. Wow. Do you know what's really dangerous about idolatry? A life distracted by the shiny objects, not devoted to God? What's really scary is that other people notice that. Our neighbors, our friends, our workmates... They know what we're actually devoted to. No matter what we say, no matter where we spend an occasional uh, Sunday, um, they, they take their cues from what we do most of the time. And, and scarier still is that our kids are the same way. They notice this. They know what is an actual priority versus an aspirational value. You know, I can, I can talk all I want. I can do my occasional religious thing all I want. My boys are noticing what I, my consistent priorities are. They just know that. Um, when, when I was a kid, um, I, I had a mom too. Still do. I have a great mom. But when I was a child, I had a mom who prioritized us going to church. Uh, I tried to fight that. I would crawl across the floor commando style silently like a stealth ninja to turn off the alarm clock on Sunday mornings so I could watch cartoons with my siblings. But my mom had this like weird capacity to wake up anyway and we'd have to get dressed up and we'd go off to this church. And we'd get to this church and uh, this is a church that had Sunday school and worship. And so in the first hour, my mom went to Sunday school. And, and I went to Sunday school, too, because of that. And the second hour, my mom went to worship, and I had to go to worship, too. And I remember, this, we did not have comfy chairs uh, with coffee cups. and all. We, This was an old-fashioned church. And, uh, and I would sit there, and I, I was like glaze-eyed bored at the preacher speaking, like some of you are right now at what I'm saying. <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, she would have to kind of poke me sometimes because I was getting way fidgety or, you know, I would just, I'd, coloring is a good thing. I colored a lot, uh, drew, drew pictures and stuff. But, uh, but I will tell you, some of it stuck. You know, some of the stuff, the stories that I was told in Sunday school and at worship, it stuck uh, deep down inside of me. I remember getting home and I would notice that during the week, my mom would actually open the Bible I can picture it. I can picture her Bible with little notes in the margin. She would read the Bible. And, and so maybe partly because of that influence, I, one summer at Daily Vacation Bible School, I started reading the Bible. And I started memorizing verses from the Bible, and I actually can still remember some of the verses I learned way back then when I was a child. Um, 
As many of you know, I, I threw that stuff aside. I stopped going to church. I became a teenager. I declared I didn't believe in God. I ran away from all of that stuff. I thought that religious people were wimps and fantasy people. I hated it all. But I think that maybe one of the reasons why I eventually turned my heart over to Jesus and came back was because of my mom's example. I could throw away her words. It was very hard for me to throw away altogether the passionate convictions by which she lived her life. And I, so mom, if you're at, she, she's out in the Netherlands right now. I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for that model. Um, what do you think your kids are observing about your life? It is never too late for a parent to set a great example. I have a friend named Brian, a uh, very beloved, wonderful man who at age 64 really woke up spiritually and decided, you know what, I got to go all in now. And I got I to gotta set an example for my family about the most important things. And that was a really important concern of his, and he was going to have a challenge to actually do that because he was dying of stage 4 pancreatic cancer. And he had very little time. It was not a rabbit's foot for him, this, this decision. He knew his days were numbered, but he was going to live them the best he possibly could. And so he began to worship more regularly. He began to study the scriptures. He began to pray uh, with his family. And he just lived it all the way until he died a few weeks back. And it made a dent in his family. It, it touched his kids it, it helped the whole family turn their heart in the direction of God in a deeper and more wonderful kind of way. It is never too late to set an example of someone who actually devotes themselves to God and makes him the first love, the first priority in life. So I hope it's helpful to think about these things. I hope you have some sense of what your actual priorities are there's easy ways to tell that. Check your calendar. Look, look, look what gets your time, what, what gets the biggest bulk of, of your investment. It helps you identify what you worship. Check your financial expenditures. They don't call it a checkbook for nothing. It tells you a lot about, um, you know, what your priorities are. Jesus taught a lot about how we use our material resources. 16 out of 38 of his parables are about how we use material resources. Jesus says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Think about that. And as you go forth today, just know you are going to be pressed on all sides by these idolatrous industries. I mean, never in world history has there been a society with more idols than America. Let's just name that. And so it's a challenge. Let's, that's why we need to be in it together. It's a challenge to avoid being sucked in and taken over and owned by these various industries that tell us, oh, your identity, your security, your significance comes from this. Let's, let's be for each other uh, in all of this because all that glitters is not gold. A lot of the shiny stuff, it's fool's gold. It cannot deliver what it is we most deeply want in life. Uh, it just can't. It can't give us the, the, the peace, <laughs> the love, the, uh, the, the joy, all of the stuff that really we most want in life. Idols have never been able to deliver those things. They're counterfeit gods, really. But Jesus he offers us the real thing. I have come, he said, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I can give you a more abundant life, but you've got to put me first, says God. You, you've got to commit to the covenant, uh, and, and you'll find me faithful in holding up my side of these things. So keep refocusing yourself as you head out uh, on this one who loves you so much and wants the best for you, uh, prioritize your life. Uh, spend your time in, in a service like this most weekends. There was a time when Americans did that more often. Now, even regular church goers, if they, if they say, yeah, it's three, three out of eight weekends, I'll show up. That's not enough to fight all the forces coming our way in life. You need a more regular experience 
of this. I can't skip five of my workout sessions, hit just three and think, oh, I'm going to be in terrific shape. No, I'm not going to be in terrific shape. I'm going to be going the other direction. Uh, get involved in a small group, perhaps. Uh, get some partners for this journey uh, where you're processing what you're hearing on the weekends and praying for each other and studying good material. Practice some spiritual disciplines for yourself. Um, you know, get a devotional. Uh, read the Bible during the week. Make a pattern of prayer more a part of your life. And be a generous servant, um, like Jesus. Be a generous servant. If, you ha have, if you've not yet committed yourself to at least trying to grow towards giving away 10% of what you have, then ask yourself, how is it that I am developed a character where I have to have more than 90% of all the riches given to me? in the wealthiest, most affluent, most provided for culture, civilization in human history, how is it that I can't figure out how to live on 90% and share with those in need at least 10? Because I think that when we're devoted to God, this is just the kind of thing we do. We imitate the generosity of our God. These are the spiritual commitments that build our devotion to him, that help us into the life abundant, and that wean us from our distraction with all of those shiny objects out there. Would you pray with me? I'll let you go. Lord, thank you so much for the uh, amazing power of your word and of your Holy Spirit. Um, please help us, God, to find the life that is truly life in all of its fullness. For your glory, for our fulfillment, for the blessing of others. This we pray, and God's people said, Amen. Amen.